I'm going to speak fairly briefly to set perhaps um, uh, just to perhaps stimulate you into um, some serious dialogue um, and points that we want to raise. So I hope we can have a lively discussion because I think that's what these sort of meetings are all about. Um, and it's a privilege to be uh, invited to come to here um, to the um, I I E A. It's slightly difficult. Um, uh, mnemonic to remember, but uh, David Walker has been pursuing me for some time. Um, but just as a matter of interest for you, I'm actually on an all-Ireland mission this week. Um, and so tomorrow I'm doing a meeting with my good friend Jim Nicholson in, uh, in Belfast, meeting uh, a lot of the business community in Belfast to talk about the challenges that they're facing, and particularly about innovation policy with David Harmon from Mrs. Gagan Quinn's cabinet. And so I took the opportunity to come down by train, because I was in Belfast last night with Owen Patterson, who's a good friend of mine, to come down here today. And it's nice to be back here, because uh, as you mentioned, Chairman, I, did, uh, I used to come here about once a month. Uh, I didn't start the distribution of Rover cars. That was about the 1920s, I think. I'm not that old yet, but <laughs> even though I'm a grandfather. But, uh, but it was an interesting time. And when I actually took over uh, the responsibility for it. The managing director, Herman O'Brien, who I knew very well, rang me on a very indistinct telephone line and said, I'm really delighted you're, uh, you're running Rover Ireland, but just to tell you, I'm phoning you on my mobile phone from a hotel in Dublin because the workers have occupied the plant, um, and so this is the first problem you have to sort out. <laughs> so that was a memorable occasion. Um, anyway, on to um, current matters. Um, what I thought I would do is um, not to talk about a lot of detailed issues, which I'm sure you will all have particular issues, but to really set the, the, the whole issue about creating and a getting the digital cinema market to work in context of everything that we are doing in the European institutions, uh, because obviously the European Parliament is but one of the key European institutions, um, but in the whole space of getting the single market to perform better. Because I think that the digital single market has very specific challenges, but many of those actually are also challenges for getting the single market to work as a whole. And that's something that the Parliament has been very exercised in. Uh, and indeed, um, some of you may know about a major political initiative called the Single Market Act, uh, which was passed a, and agreed a few months ago. Uh, and the Single Market Act is a political program. It includes some legislation, but it includes a lot of non-legislative initiatives. And it's a shared political program between the European institutions and member governments. And I mean, that is absolutely crucial because so many of the issues, and it's true in the digital space as it is everywhere else, are actually issues uh, which can't be solved by a great legislative initiative from, uh, from the European institutions, but actually need real engagement by players, citizens, and governments to move them forward. And indeed, in the digital space, I think it needs actions by enterprises to take advantage of that. It needs, uh, it needs action by consumer groups, uh, by civil society, um, and it, it needs uh, other areas of attention, for example, like improving the whole access to justice for consumers, alternative dispute resolution systems. You know, these are all part of a, of a complex and really interesting and challenging space. But I would say, first of all, that I think the fact that we actually have now um, a program which includes all of these aspects, and I think it's a very thorough program, and there are, some, there are a few leaflets around the place which you can take. I'm not sure I've got enough for everybody, but this is the summary of the Single Market Act. And you'll see the title of it, Together for New Growth, um, is exactly, encompasses exactly what I said. You know, the, the, the single market is absolutely indispensable uh, for accelerating the growth of the European economy out of recession. And so... I suppose the global point I would make to you, first of all, in, 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 in encompassing this together, is that while a, a huge amount of attention, understandably, and particularly in this country, is being focused on the future of the single European currency, and maybe there will be questions about that, but the fact remains is that while that's been going on, there has a lot of other work been going on, um, some of it in more public space, but a lot behind the scenes to say that underpinning Europe's recovery, as well as solving the problems with Europe, has got to be 
to build on our huge competitive advantage of getting a single market to work across 27 countries. Because if we don't seize that competitive advantage, then we will sink further down the league table. And interestingly, um, the second exhibit, I just wanted to link into that. Because in a way, it's a question that I get all the time. The people say, well, how do you reconcile being a Eurosceptic British Conservative with all the things you're doing in Europe? Well, I certainly wouldn't describe myself as a Eurosceptic. Um, but the contemporary phrase now is a Eurorealist. Uh, because um, I think we are taking a more realistic view about what we can achieve and how we can achieve it and how quickly we can achieve it. And the fact that it's not always big, centralised uh, regulatory projects that will solve issues. But interestingly, a part of the inspiration for this title, Together for New Growth, came from this. And this is a pamphlet called Let's Choose Growth. Um, and it's actually, on the back, comes from the Prime Minister's office in 10 Downing Street. And this actually came out before the Single Market Act at a time when Michel Barnier was looking for a title for it. And interestingly, when Michel Barnier came to our committee to launch the Single Market Act, he held out this chart from this pamphlet. And he said, I'm very indebted to Malcolm Parker and David Cameron for giving me this chart, which shows what will happen if we don't get our act together. Because basically, this is 2010, with Germany, UK, France, and Italy in the top 10 world economies. And here we are tailing off towards the end. The fact that in 2050, Downing Street had found an economic study which said France was behind the UK. And they also peaked Mr. <laughs> Barnier. <laughs> um, but you know, this, 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 this is focusing people's attention on what competitiveness is all about. Um, and other policies, like innovation, which we're going to talk about, and I'm going to be talking about in Belfast tomorrow, are also part of this. So, um, so where does the digital single market fit in all of this? Well, the paradox, I think, about the impact of, of the internet as a commercial tool, as a tool for commerce, um, is that um, it, within the European economic space, it hasn't actually, I think, delivered the sort of benefits that people expected it to. And so we need to understand why that is and how far it's because of legislation, or how far it's because of consumer attitudes. And another interesting piece of work that's just come out, and I'm sorry to deceive you with references, but this is a, a research organization, so I'm sure that the efficient David Walker will send you a compendium with links and where you can download all these documents mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, this is a new publication which hasn't had much publicity, but it's something that we asked for in the committee. So you can see I'm, I, we work very well with the European Commission and Michel Barnier uh, in, in a very good relationship in terms of taking political initiatives and moving things forward. And this is despite the fact, of course, the Commission retains the right of initiative in the European institutions. But sometimes it exercises them quite softly and does listen very attentively to what we have to say. Um, we wanted... Um, uh, we wanted to focus on getting the single market to have real traction with Europe's citizens, and particularly citizen consumers. Because uh, part of the problem is, and this is a well-known phrase, I think, that Jacques Delors uh, once said, is that nobody can fall in love with the single market. And it is perhaps a dry concept, but actually, if you think about the entitlements that European citizens should have from a fully functioning single market. The ability to go and live and work and raise a family in any part of the European Union. And similarly, for businesses, the right to sell goods to establish businesses, to offer services in any part of the European Union. And if you think of them in terms of entitlements, you know, our task as politicians is to say, how well are those entitlements being delivered? And one of the things we asked the Commission was, how much do we know about what citizens really think about their entitlements in the European economic space? Because actually, in terms of the psychology of the single market, where it really impacts on individual citizens, we're notably failing to deliver. This paper, which is a working document, uh, which is rather a nice title, The Single Market Through the Lens of the People, 
a snapshot of citizens and businesses' 20 main concerns. Now, these aren't in any particular order, but interestingly, a concern number, thir number 13, Europeans do not feel comfortable shopping online in other member states. And so the first point in, in now moving from the sort of big picture to the specific issue um, is I think that we absolutely underestimated um, the need to deal with the consumer's lack of security and understanding about their rights actually shopping across the border. Because that is one of the reasons why predominantly, if you look at all the data, um, that online shopping is still predominantly within the same member states. In many cases, it's grown very actively. It's a major activity. It's very important to the economy. But if we really see it as a tool for making the single market work, we're not actually doing very well. Um, so, um, but it's interesting now that it, it appears here as part of the scores here. I mean, there are a whole lot of other stuff in here, again, which is all part of that. You know, not surprisingly, internet and telephone services could be cheaper, mobile phone roaming. Um, uh, there's things about problems that people experience in moving to other countries, taking their car with them, uh, having to apply for residence permits, getting their children to school, whatever. But all the things that people expect ought to happen in the single market. So um, one of the things that uh, my committee has been working on recently is, first of all, to try and... and agree and get an agreement on a core set of consumer rights um, online, essentially, in distant selling, about people's, um, people, the, 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 the contractual terms, the pre-contractual information that people will get if they're undertaking a transaction, their right to reject an article, their right to return it, who pays for the cost of return, um, their ability to contact someone, contact information, um, uh, a cooling off period if they're taking a long term contract, all those sort of things. And, and that is now in place, and we're hoping that it, that will significantly improve matters. But actually, it needs communication. And though, even though we can provide people with these rights, how many people actually know what rights they have? Um, the consumers just, uh, the, the Commission has just done a very interesting study, which again you can find on the on the DG Health and Consumer Protection website, called Consumer Empowerment in the Single Market. And what is remarkable there is, first of all, how few consumers know what rights they have now in the existing system. But secondly, the remarkable variation about that level of knowledge from country to country. Um, and what's interesting here, and this is by no means unusual, um, is that the country where consumers have more awareness of their rights in this whole area is not even a member of the European Union, and that's Norway. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think why um, Norway is setting the pace here, and by the way, if you look at the single market generally, that Norway complies uh, more fully and more quickly with single market regulations than any other country who is a member of the European Union. Uh, in areas like public procurement, we see that Norway is setting the pace. Um, in, in consumer rights in particular, where in Norway they have a very good system of uh, consumer ombudsman, or alternative dispute resolution, whatever you want to call it, in different sectors, which is covered by a very light-touch framework in the Norwegian procurement authorities, where each sector has set up their own purpose-built consumer ombudsman process, which Norwegian consumers value and are aware of. And one of the things that will be coming to us shortly is a proposal from the Commission to try and provide a framework to encourage other countries to do this. And I use that word advisedly because this is clearly not something where you will have a single European regulation to do this because they need to be tailor-made essentially in, country, in individual countries. Uh, so these sort of soft things like dealing with disputes on, online and having online mechanisms, encouraging consumers to take advantage of that are, are critically important. Um, I think that um, obviously consumers need to be aware of that as well. Um, we need to make consumers aware of the rights that they have when they shop online. Um, the other thing um, is, of course, um, giving consumers much more confidence about, first of all, the transaction itself, about giving their credit card or bank card details, actually making the payments in a secure environment, 
and, and also how their data is going to be used in some sort of marketing and promotional message. So personal data protection and security are both important, very important. Now, as far as payment transactions are concerned, I think it's fair to say, and I know there are a number of people from the banking community, it's fair to say that actually we made real improvements in payment security. But the fact remains is that people still feel insecure about offering their payment details into a computer, uh, whereas they still seem perfectly prepared to go to a restaurant and allow um, the waiter to take away their, their credit card and process yeah. it somewhere else. So even that is now finally coming to an end because they bring the machine to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I would say that industry and consumer groups, if we're going to get the single market to work properly, have got some work to do here around all of these soft factors about dealing with complaints, about security, we are going to have more reforms about how personal data is collected and used, which we worked on as part of the telecom package, specifically for companies in the electronic communications sector, which are now going to be extended more broadly. But we're still some way of getting some new proposals on that. But for example, um, and this again has been not generally known at all, it's had very little publicity, but Companies in the electronic communication sector are now, required, are now obliged to comply with the requirements for notifying consumers if their personal data is breached, if the security of their personal data is breached. Data breach notification. And Mrs. Redding is now responsible for that, having moved in 2009 to look after justice and home affairs, has already indicated that that will become part of a new reform of the general data protection legislation uh, so that we will have formal requirements for data breach notification for anybody who holds data, whether it's held electronically or not. Uh, so these sort of things are important. And, and, and the other thing that I know has caused consternation with some, which is still baffling me, rather given the, the, what we thought was a very clear expression of that in the privacy directive, is about how um, website operators use personal data um, in engagement with the customers through cookies and other devices which many customers value. Um, and there was never any intention in, when we drafted this legislation to have any sort of um, provision that would require separate approval every time you made a transaction with an internet site. What was asked for was that the first time a customer makes a contact and you offer the customer the opportunity to, if you like, become a friend of our website, to get offers that are customized to you, that you actually consent to that transaction. And that was what was in the proposal to begin with. It seems to have caused a lot of problem around the place, rather to my surprise. But if anyone is concerned about that, that is what was intended. Now, so all of those things we've been working on. So, uh, and then alongside that will become other things which will help the process, but are not necessarily, in my view, so much part of the consumer transaction. Um, electronic signatures, authentication, I think is very much crucial to getting more online business-to-business -business transactions. In some areas, it will have a consumer focus as well. And indeed, in things like online banking, we're seeing more electronic authentication devices and other things developing. So there is a sort of standards and legal and recognition challenge coming up, and those will be on our workload for next year. So, um, so that's a sort of picture around some of the consumer things that we're working on. Um, and just to... So round off the picture um, is to say to you that um, one of the fundamental uh, fundamental pieces of legislation, which I think was a very far-sighted piece of legislation, and I would say that because I started working on it in 1999 and 2000, is the e-commerce directive. And the e-commerce directive was passed by the European Commission um, all, that, all that time ago, and I think has actually provided a good basis for moving online transactions forward. Now, one of the most um, difficult areas on that, which is coming up for discussion, is what is the role of internet service providers? The, in, the trusted intermediary role. Um, and um, because the e-commerce the, the e directive actually gave them a very specific role where they're not deemed to be responsible for the content that they, that they carry. Um, but um, with a notice and takedown provision, that if people complain about the site, then they are required to take it down. And as you know, those of you that I'm sure questions about copyright will come up, um, that that has also been one of the big issues that telecom regulators and others are having to deal with about 
um, uh, illegal downloading, illegal downloading sites, and so on. So all of those things will be in the frame. The Commission is currently consulting on the review of the e-commerce directive at the moment. Uh, my own personal view is it's very important not to destabilise, I think, the position we have at the moment. Uh, because, uh, as I've indicated, uh, I think that the um, online marketplace is not yet delivering the benefits it should do in making the single market work better. Um, and there are, there are other things to talk about as well, I'm sure we'll come up in discussion. Now, um, just to sort of round all this off, and then we'll, we'll perhaps have some questions. I think that um, since 2009, with this Parliament and this Commission, we're getting much, much better at working on all these complementary policy issues. You know, the Single Market Act, I think, involved about 16 European commissioners who own different parts of the Single Market Act. I think there are some parts of the single market, by the way, that we haven't fully integrated into this, and I think transport in particular. You know, the role of logistics, transport, and postal services, and by the way, those are crucial also in online, if you look at consumer complaints online, because consumers are still worried that they will actually get the article delivered if they, uh, they order something from Dublin from a, a supplier in Estonia, for example. Uh, you know, there are still worries about whether it will be delivered in the right condition and how quickly. Mm. Though, as we know, um, the, 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 the online delivery service um, is now working extremely efficiently across Europe. Uh, and they very much benefited them and have been part of the key intermediaries in making the, the, the single market online work successful. But when, when physical goods are involved. Uh, so that is included in the single market app. Um, uh, Online payments, um, getting online payment costs down, uh, enabling small amounts of payments online, particularly with mobile devices, mobile commerce, all of those things will be on the agenda. And it goes without saying that underpinning all of this is, of course, the availability of, uh, of, of high quality, good value mobile broadband services. I won't say cheap because I think that undervalues it but it does need to be good value for money and it needs to encourage investment. And it goes without saying that that, so, that, so in a way the telecom legislation, which I've worked on and many of you are interested in, is part of this whole underpinning uh, of what we need to do. But I think, let's not forget the business to business element as well, because that is also crucial. And in my view, that needs to work better. I mean, there's an astonishingly low amount still of online transactions and business to business transactions that still go on on the internet. Um, and uh, in areas like public procurement, for example, uh, which is another of the areas that my committee is currently looking at, a major reform of public procurement, I mean, more e-procurement from public authorities, um, and done in a way that would encourage small enterprises to be able to make bids into public authorities, I think will be a crucial labour of the business-to-business -business market. Mm. So I've talked a lot about business-to-consumer, where I think the, the dysfunctionalities are, but, but really business to business also needs to improve and, and be looked at uh, very substantially. So, uh, so we're working on all those elements of, of those things. Uh, what, what, how do politicians, how do you respond to some of these more difficult issues which involve lots of other different committees and different politicians? Uh, what we've done in my committee is to set up um, a working group specifically around completing the digital single market. Uh, it's chaired very well by uh, a colleague from Spain, Pablo Arias. Um, they meet together very openly and invite evidence. We can, we can send you their working documents. Uh, he presented a report and a presentation to the committee, which you can also find on our website. Uh, we've also commissioned some interesting research recently, which I commend to you, because each committee in the European Parliament has a research budget to commission research to help us with our work. We've just done a very interesting study, and this is just the cover of it because it's 130 pages, but you can get it free of charge on our internet. Uh, consumer behavior in the digital environment, which has a lot of very interesting um, data and statistics, actually culled from public sources largely. We haven't commissioned a lot of our own work, uh, original research work, um, about, but about what consumers value in the single market, how they use the single market to affect transactions, the role of the internet in facilitating price comparisons, because in thinking about the digital single market, we're not just 
interested in transactions that are completed on the single market. We're interested in the way that the, the internet is facilitating a more competitive and open market. And one of the interesting and I think challenging issues in here, which, and it's been supported by a number of studies that have been done in different countries, is the fact that in many cases consumers can have too much information to deal with. And even though in theory we're giving them this fantastic choice, if you actually overwhelm them with choice, they need to go to some sort of trusted intermediaries, consumer reports, or they may even use an intermediary in order to help them find the best deals. And in areas like insurance, you will see it here, there are companies um, who are set up specifically to, to intermediate with these very offers on behalf of the consumer, but, and of course I'm creating a new business out of it. Which if you started on the single market uh, journey uh, from the beginning, you would think wouldn't necessarily arise because consumers would be able to do that for themselves. And similarly, we know how important um, search engines are to consumers. But of course, search engine offers and the way that the versions may be presented may not necessarily be there just because of the quality of the product, but because somebody has bought advertising. Uh, so issues about transparency here, I think, are particularly important. Uh, we've also done a study called the Digital Internal Market. Again, you can find it on our website, uh, which looks about issues on electronic signatures and e-procurement and so on. So, so do have a look if you're interested. And just to conclude, because I always like to make sure that, that our promotional work is in line, in order, you can see that I have been in marketing previously. Um, we, my committee does a newsletter. We are the first European Parliament committee to do a regular newsletter. Uh, and if you can become, and I hope you will all become, a friend of IMCO, a friend of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee, you can go onto our website, you can sign up to this, it will come electronically to your mailbox before every committee meeting. So it will show you what's on the agenda. It will show you what's being webcast if you want to have a look and see what we're doing. Uh, it has links to copies of all the texts that we're working on. Uh, and also it gives you access directly to the rapporteurs of those committees. Uh, so we hope that you will become one of the 1,600... Well, we have 1, nearly 1,600 people, um, which isn't a lot in a European context, but it's probably a lot more than other committees. So we hope very much that you will want to become our friend. So, just to round it off, um, it's a great opportunity to come and just share some ideas with you. I look forward to your questions on any of those related topics, uh, and indeed any other areas I suspect that may be on your mind on European politics. Um, but I hope that you feel that there are people involved in the European policy making scene who are, understand the cost linkages and the importance of digital activity to the economy. And um, I think that coming back to this overwhelming problem that we have in Europe, which is to get a much stronger, faster growing economy, um, an effective, well-functioning digital market in terms of job creation and economic activity is absolutely indispensable to Europe's economic recovery. I mean, I think that that's not just me saying that. I think there's lots of evidence. McKinsey's did a very interesting study for the big... A seminar that President Sarkozy put on in Doha recently, which again you can find, I think it's around the place. We have copies of it. Uh, and the McKinsey's global study demonstrates this absolutely and has more statistical data. So this isn't just an academic project. It's not just a project for internet geeks and people who are interested in internet shopping. This is fundamental to Europe's economic future. I put it as strongly as that. Which is why it's really crucial to have this partnership between citizens, consumers, enterprises, and public policy to get the single market really energised. Um, in, in a month's time, uh, we're hoping to get over a 1,000 people meeting together in Krakow uh, under the patronage of the Polish presidency, because Poland is running the European business at the moment, for the first ever large-scale single market forum. Again, you can find details on the website. It's an open activity. There will be workshops. There will be a public display. There will be plenary sessions. Um, there will be lots of my colleagues there as well working on different aspects. And we will have workshops on a lot of the things we've talked about. Uh, and that is, I think, an indication that we need to engage more with citizens. This is a pilot project. It may become more decentralised in the future. But I think it's great um, that the Institute here is so important and is so engaged. 
Um, and I think you are a key player in this partnership. So, and I know you've done a lot of work on the single market already. So I'm very pleased to be able to come and support that here today. But to say to you, you know, this is the biggest challenge that we face in sustaining Europe's competitiveness. Um, and the digital single market is one of the crucial building blocks for the future. Thank you very much.